Coming up on Nebraska Stories, the return of the Sandhill Trumpeter Swans, a visit to a Buddhist temple built by refugees, the unlikely friendship between composer Philip Glass and pianist Paul Barnes, and growing citrus on the high plains. The trumpeter swan is a really neat success story. They went extinct in the sand hills. Trumpeter swans are really good indicator species of the habitat quality. They're a big, beautiful white bird that is an icon of the Nebraska sand hills. The sand hills is still one of the last remaining intact grasslands left in the world. This is probably one of the few places where private industry, private ranchers have improved the land. I hope that I always get to make my life here in the Sand Hills. They're huge and they're heavenly white. A trumpeter swan actually is the largest waterfowl species in the world and they're beautiful. They're birds that are indicators of good water quality. They need big open grasslands and wetlands and open bodies of water in order to thrive. We really don't know a lot about them, about their behavior. It's really fun to learn about them. <laughs> My name is Heather Johnson and I'm uh, researching trumpeter swans in the Nebraska sand hills at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. I'm also a wildlife biologist with Nebraska Game and Parks studying waterfowl. So historically, trumpeter swans breeding range range all the way up in Alaska and the boreal forest and then the sand hills was the very south tip of that breeding range and populations were upwards probably about half a million to a million. The fur trade industry played a large role in the depletion of the population of trumpeter swans. Their down feathers on their belly was very desired for women's powder puffs. The feathers were desired for clothing and hats and quill pens. In fact, Audubon himself preferred a quill pen for his drawings. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act is what saved these birds in 1918. Had that treaty been not put into place, we would not have trumpeter swans today. Nebraska sand hills was a, was a core of their range, and they were wiped out of the sand hills, wiped out in Nebraska, and then through conservation laws and a lot of conservation efforts over the last 100 years, trumpeter swans have started to come back. That look easy. <laughs> I didn't know he had one. Oh, yeah. We take an airboat out. We run up next to these birds and gently scoop them up with a big old scoop net. And then we bring them back. And then collect what we call body condition data. And that's how you can determine how healthy a bird is. And over the last three years, we've been putting on GPS satellite collars. So we've been tracking these swans. And we're looking where they're going in the winter. Um, let's take her back down there.
We're trying to get a handle on the population numbers, and not necessarily just the numbers, but the trends, if they're going up or going down. And what we have been seeing actually over the years is we've seen an increasing population. So the overall number of swans has increased, but the proportion of juveniles is kind of slightly decreasing. There's a lot of opportunity for predators to get a hold of these birds. Some predators would include northern pike, snapping turtles, birds of prey. Those are kind of their main predators. And then there's also, you know, weather, many other factors that can affect survival. Well, one of the things that we're anticipating or could anticipate, um, you know, wind energies and one of those things that may be cropping up in the sand hills and it has in, in one or two spots. And with that, you have a lot of transmission lines and so forth. And some of those things may be cutting across some of the wintering areas that these birds use. And so what would that do for those swans? Uh, where you put those transmission lines are really important because if you put them next to a key wintering ground, you know, these birds didn't evolve with big, long, thick wires spanning across the sky, you know, so um, that can be a, a death trap. first time I saw a trumpeter swan was probably in the late 60s at La Creek up there north of Maryland. My name's A.B. Cox and I live on Calf Creek Ranch. This is Calf Creek, uh, north of Mullen, Nebraska in southern Cherry County. I'm Shelley Kelly. I grew up uh, by Brewster, Nebraska on a ranch, family operation, and uh, just always loved the sand hills. The trumpeter swan is kind of a iconic species because it sticks out so much. People pay attention to the swans and even ranchers that have lived here their whole lives, uh, like myself, when we see a trumpeter swan, it's really exciting. What we do know is if we have a healthy landscape, we know that it's better for the swans. It's not a competing interest. You know, wildlife and, and ranching, they're not on different hands. They share the same goals. Those ranchers have been real good stewards of this landscape because they need good grass too. You know, in a way, they're grass farmers. We just see it as we are trying to be good stewards and leave it as best we can. I care about these birds because they're remarkable. I think about what would the world look like if they weren't in it. You know, to me it'd be a um, pretty boring place. It's a real conservation success story. That's because of an awful lot of people that are dedicated their lives and their efforts to help bring these birds back. So it's a pretty cool deal, but there's no finish line in conservation and um, so we have to keep, keep thinking about these birds and what they represent and, and um, really celebrate them so we can have them around for a long time. After the Vietnam War, emigration from Vietnam was at an all-time high. The United Nations created an orderly departure program to make emigration safer and provide proper legal channels. In 1990, Lincoln was declared a refugee-friendly city by the U.S. State Department, making Lincoln a major resettlement site for Vietnamese refugees. Settling into their new home included finding a way to keep their culture alive. Many found sanctuary in Lincoln's Catholic community. 
But for Buddhists, there was no gathering place. So in 1991, a group of Vietnamese Nebraskans founded the Ling Guang Buddhist Temple. My uh, dad was one of the founding members of this temple. When they came here, a way for them to just kind of get together uh, was through religion. My family and I came to America in 1993. Um, we didn't actually start going to the temple until maybe a few years later, um, but we've always been Buddhists. In the early years of Ling Guang Buddhist Temple, a renovated house served as the meeting site. And in 2007 was when we came out here, um, and uh, we had the groundbreaking ceremony, um, and then the building process started. And then 2011 was the grand opening. Uh, that we had this location. A lot of these here that you can see are statues that are, we just uh, recently got brought over from Vietnam. Retaining our Vietnamese cultural heritage is something very important um, to my parents, and that's something that um, you know we were taught along, you know, at a very young age. The first language of many worshipers at Ling Guang Buddhist Temple is Vietnamese, and the services are still offered in their native tongue. There are, of course, other reasons sacred text and worship services are not translated. Some of the, the words, the teaching, is actually very deep, very, it has different meaning, and so when we translate that to English, it doesn't necessarily translate it correctly. There are two types of services. There's the main one in here, and then there's a separate one for the Buddhist youth group. The older people are generally in here doing the praying and the ceremony with the monk. ceremony, uh, we have the gong, we call it the jung, and then we have the wooden ma. This is made out of wood, and um, this is more of rhythm. It's, uh, it provides rhythm when you chant. So the guy that you saw with the gong, that, that was my dad, actually. <laughs> so he's been doing it for years, and so there's certain parts in the book where you're supposed to hit, and he just notes it by heart. At Ling Guang, some have been on the journey all their lives, while others are new to the practice. One of the foundations of Buddhism is seeking peaceful living. The main teaching or purpose of uh, Buddhism is so that people can live with compassion, with harmony, and with love. When Buddha was first born, he took seven steps, and each step that he took, a lotus flower bloomed beneath his foot. A lotus. It grows in a very swampy, dirty area, right? However, when it blooms, uh, it's very beautiful. And so as a Buddhist, you're kind of like a lotus. You don't let all of those bad things influence you. We have the story of Buddha playing out in these five panels here. It starts with his birth and then to the point where he decides to give up the throne and give up uh, his power being the prince to seek enlightenment. Buddhism is full of symbolism. From numbers to colors, every detail points back to Buddha's teaching. Those uh, four pillars, they represent the entryway into the temple. And if you can imagine the three split in between, representing the past, the present, or the future, there's Chinese scripts as well as Vietnamese script basically saying those that pass through the temple may be blessed. Inside the temple, symbolic gray robes are worn during the services as people pray and chant. So when you come in here, we're all equal, right? Put it on that robe, we're all the same. So after our service, we would invite everybody here to come and join us in the what they call a gathering place to just enjoy a free lunch with everybody, kind of bond with one another. People don't always expect to find a Buddhist temple in Lincoln, Nebraska, but the members of Ling Guang love to open their doors to new people. Uh, we're welcome those people who want to come to the temple for a prayer or just for peace of uh, quiet and yeah, the teaching. For me, this whole area just brings about calm. It's just a quiet place where you just sit and to reflect. Buddhist is a religion, but it's, to me, it's, it's more like a teaching. Just a way so that you would learn to live life rather than follow it blindly and not understand it. At least understand why you're a Buddhist. In my opinion, I, I think that's important.
thing that's the hardest about this whole piece is the, the coda. Paul Barnes has spent months practicing for a new piece he commissioned from a favorite composer. There. But yeah, these two pages are by far the hardest. Barnes is a piano virtuoso who splits his time between teaching at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and performing classical concerts across the globe. And this is the section that, Philip, let me add all of those wonderful octaves here. Uh... The Philip to whom he refers is none other than the world-renowned composer Philip Glass, widely regarded as one of the most influential composers working today. Beautiful epiphany chord there. The two met by chance 24 years ago on an airplane leaving Lincoln, Nebraska. On that flight, as I was sitting down, I saw Philip Glass get on the plane. And the seat next to him was empty. And so I just, in a fit of divine inspiration, hopped over the aisle. And before I knew it, I'm talking to one of my favorite people on the planet, Philip Glass. They've been on and off collaborators ever since, forming a friendship through music. Barnes first commissioned a piece from Glass in 2004. This latest commission is a bit different. Long known for his innovative and experimental symphonies, film scores, and operas, this is Glass's first piano quintet and his first piece inspired by a Byzantine chant. The music that he gave me to work with was very interesting to work with. The uh, harmonic changes are very suppressed. It's not what we hear in modern music. And frankly, I didn't know whether he was gonna like it or not. I had no idea how he was going to be able to deal with that. When I got the manuscript in the mail and played through the first way that he dealt with the theme, I was just stunned because it was so beautiful. Oh, I still remember the first time I played this. I was so happy. While Glass may have had some critics in earlier years, he remains in high demand. In 2018, he was presented with a Lifetime Artistic Achievement Award at the Kennedy Center Honors. And getting on Glass's schedule is a challenge. Glass is on a whirlwind trip to the Midwest from his home in New York for the world premiere of his latest work, but not before a jam-packed day of rehearsals and finessing. If I were to redo that today, I would put in a full horn section. Oh, I see. And a lot of introductions. I want to introduce my student, Sean. I want to introduce you to Philip Glass. This is the UNL Orchestra. This is Philip Glass. <laughs> In some ways, they are an unlikely pair. 82-year-old Glass is soft-spoken, measured, yet deliberate with his input and composing. This is the section where I just want to fill it out a little bit in octaves, and I want you to hear it first, OK? So when I'm here with the quintet, is it a little fast? Well, we really go fast here. So, yeah, but you're already. You're, you're, yeah, we're at 144. Is what was we it, where, to do where, this. where were you in the previous? Uh, Barnes yeah. is a fire hose of energy, alternating rapid fire expressiveness with nuance. Was, well, and this, by the way, is the hardest part in the whole quintet. Why is that? Because it is. It definitely write music that's challenging for him, but why, why shouldn't I? He always does it. And if this is where you definitely wanted things faster. Why write something that he can play? <laughs> and then a little bit of a poco rent, and then right into the... Both are passionate and seem to have the kind of undeniable connection of two masters at the top of their game. I love the ending, I love it. We're very different. I'm way over the top, you know, and he's much more contemplative. I guess that sounds like a good prescription for a rich friendship. We aren't the same, we're different, but we're different in interesting ways. Here we go. At the end of the day, there's more work to do. One last rehearsal. Glass has never heard his piano quintet played by musicians, and the performers are still finding their way with the new work. 
I think it works better just to go ahead and stick with, you know, because we have this nice big retard. So maybe, let's try that again. I think Can we, we try that, that again? Even the night before the world premiere, changes are still being made to the work. Can we do a first time at 30? It wasn't exactly together at the end. Mm -hmm. Right. You want exactly together. Well, don't you? <laughs> you want to take it right at, uh, right at 28? But I think also when you begin that last thing, it should be a little bit louder. I wouldn't make that an eighth note. Yeah, yeah, I like it better with an eighth note. I think so, too. This will go on for a while with a new piece. It could go on for a month or go on for years. I'm still making corrections to pieces that I wrote years ago. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> well, it's I, a tiny thing, but. The way a piece ends is huge. First night is like a birth. It's very much like having children for the first time. And the, people will tell you that. That's something, there's something new in the world that wasn't there before. And that's an astonishing thing when you think about it. It doesn't happen every day. We have witnesses, we have audiences, we have the sharing of that experience, what I call the transaction. The reason they come for the opening night, because that's the night where the highest charge of emotion will be in that night. The audience is a catalyst. It's a, it's a match that lights the fire. Oh, he's a very good player. Doing concert for 50 years, so I have favorite players, and he's one of the best of the best. He is uh, completely engaged in what he's doing. The way he walks on the stage, where he sits down, the way he plays. This is a man who's doing exactly what he should be, should be doing. Some of it is hard enough that you just have to be thinking about nailing the music. But when you're really solid with the, the music, then you're experiencing it right along with all of the audience. One of the pleasures of living a life of a performer and life of an artist is the richness on the human side of the friendships. It goes very deep. Sometimes the feelings you have no other way of expressing. When I hear someone playing my music and I say, oh, I sometimes say, I wish I could play it like that. It means that they found something in music that I didn't know was there. And that can happen. We have lots of other plans. You're gonna write your second piano sonata for me. Yeah, I think right. we decided that, didn't we? Well, we yes. talked about it, we did. We'll see I, I, it's so easy for me to I haven't written the first so one yet, you see. No, but it's, it's well, taken care, it's spoken for, so I'm gonna get the second piano sonata. So yeah. probably for your, what is it, 85th, perfect. Let's plan it for your 85th celebration, <laughs> all right? There's time, there's time for more music, I think. We can grow the best citrus in the world right here you know, on the high plains. I'm Russ Finch, and this is the first greenhouse in the snow, Alliance, Nebraska, center of the panhandle on the high plains. There have been hardly any successful 12-month greenhouses on the high plains. The cost of energy is just too high for it, but by tapping into the earth heat, 
we've been able to uh, drastically reduce the, the cost. All we try to do is keep it above 28 degrees in the winter. And uh, we have no backup system for heat. The only heat source is uh, uh, Earth's heat at 52 degrees at eight foot deep. And uh, we flow that through the, the uh, tubes that are underground. Newer designs are running about a dollar a day for energy. It's a fraction of the cost of fossil fuels. But to prove that the system would work, we knew we had to grow something besides geraniums and roses and things like that. So we hit on the, the figs and the citrus. Uh, these are Valencia oranges. Practically all the juice comes from uh, Valencias. They're the, the uh, trees that they're losing in Florida now because of the greening disease. We not only can grow them cheaper on, on cheaper land, we've got the water, abundant sunshine, and also we don't have the transportation costs. We can grow practically any tropical plant. Uh, I think you can even grow bananas in a new design. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.